So we are coming to the next talk. I'm happy to welcome Alonia. Hi, Alonia. Hello, hello. So from where are you streaming from? Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Ah, okay. We have I think we have many people streaming from Amsterdam. Oh, cool. Year. So it's nice there, of course. And you are doing machine learning. Oh yeah, and everything related to it, indeed. That's great. Yeah, that's what I sometimes do too. So <laughs> please, <laughs> please start your talk. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, great. So yeah, first of all, happy to see everyone here. Thanks for joining. Also, I was uh, happy to see the previous speaker. I'm really, really surprised to see the youngest speaker ever in Europython. So I think the Europython org team did a really great job to find a good speaker. So yeah, without further ado, let's start. Um, so we have uh, 25 minutes and then five minutes for Q&A. So yeah, without further ado, that's what we're going to do actually today. We start with introduction. So you need to know who am I? Why should you listen to me, of course? And then we're going to discuss the awesome solution. So this solution will allow you to build a ML pipeline out of the box in one line of code. And also, there is a possibility to add this pipeline anytime, even in production environment. So yeah, sounds like it's good to be true. Indeed, yes, that's not what my talk about. So if you want to find one-stop solution that fits all sizes, um, I'm not the right person to talk, probably. Um, but let's get back to the point. So yeah, that's indeed the real agenda that we're going to uh, do today. So um, the whole conference is full of really awesome talks and tutorials and also sprints uh, that will discuss a lot of wonderful Python open source libraries to help you fix uh, specific issues or make your life much easier via automation. So in this case, I want to get a little bit, um, let's say, high over and to discuss a pretty, pretty important concept that is usually neglected. And we're starting to think about this concept, unfortunately, uh, when we are already in production environments. And I just want to save you some time, nerves, uh, especially money, costs. So let's uh, take a look what we're going to discuss today um i will show you the concept of a machine learning pipeline why we need to use it when it's useful to use it then we move to the building blocks of it and i also will share some let's say hard learnings from my own experience then we'll take a look at engineering around failures and engineering for performance of course there will be some time spent on debugging and monitoring and as a bonus, there will be open source Python libraries to save your time. And quick tip, uh, in my case, all these libraries are literally battle tested in production environments. So I only share the things that I used to work with, uh, at least open source ones. OK, so yeah, who am I? Uh, why should you listen to me? Um, my name is Aliona Galeva. I'm streaming right now from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. I have a full-time job. Uh, in this job, I'm a developer, or um, as the title said, um, applied AI and data engineering leads. Uh, so in this case, what I'm doing, I'm working with a great team of engineers, and we're helping different companies to find the best data engineering or AI engineering solutions. So literally helping organizations to become more data-driven and do it mostly in enterprise environments. So it adds extra layer of complexity. On top of it, I have a nonprofit, Pi Ladies Amsterdam. Probably some of you just rolled eyes right now, say, oh, hey, ladies again. No, it's not about that. Pi Ladies Amsterdam is the Amsterdam chapter of a global nonprofit. And our specialization is on doing workshops and boot camps. We do talks from time to time, but the majority of the time is every month you can expect a workshop. And we do it on two levels, completely beginners and more advanced levels if you want to deep dive into specific uh, topics in Python. And on the pictures, just like the pictures of the previous events, uh, we were doing everything offline before COVID. And with COVID, we moved completely online and doing things only online right now. Um, also, I'm helping different AI startups uh, as a tech mentor. And uh, this year, I was awarded with um, Microsoft Most Valuable Professional Award in, in the field of AI. So yeah, as I mentioned, this talk is based on some 
high level facts, but it's all based on my own experience. And I just want to share it with you to make sure that you're not making the same mistakes that I made um, in the past. So yeah, um, machine learning pipeline, what it is and when you need it, like every use cases of data science projects need it or not. In a nutshell, think about pipeline as a sequence of automated steps. And these steps could be small or could be big. And these steps can be even implemented in different languages. And if you have this sequence of steps automated in a specific way, it makes everything that you do reproducible and easy to scale and also easy to move between environments. So let's say, why do we need this pipeline? Okay. When I do something regarding machine learning, I also have a set of specific steps, then why should I automate it? Um, pretty simple set. It's reduced the cost of any data science project in a huge way. From one side, it sounds like a time investment in the beginning when you need to set up specific processes. But when it's set up, it's free away a lot of time of data scientists. Uh, frankly speaking, a little bit hate um, um, or probably not so. Okay, um, I don't like the statement that data scientists are not engineers. Uh, it's a true and false at the same time. Sorry, binary classification will not going to work here. But in the case, are we talking about the team that has different types of engineers and data scientists on board, or are we talking about the startup where the data scientists should do everything from scratch, from zero to hero? Uh, the situations are different, but if you have some reproducible orchestrated steps, it will reduce the cost of any project. And in the majority of the cases, it will do it by actually let data scientists switch their focus on experimenting with new cases, what's, uh, with new ad hoc queries from business people. And if it's about modeling, if we went, if we are, let's say, there in the modeling part, it allows you as well spend more time on doing proper feature engineering, uh, hyper-tuning parameters, instead of fixing just an array of like stream of bugs that come in from production environments when your model will be failing each day. On top of it, if you have specific automation in place, it as well prevent bugs. And later I will share, let's say, my top three time eaters regarding bugs. And that's what I'm trying to fix first when I'm starting working on an MLOps project. So another thing is add the auditable paper trace. And what do I mean by that? If we know how the pipeline was run, by whom, when, in which capacity, you can trace from the source of the raw data to the source of your predictions, um, post process of your predictions, and as well the modeling feedback. So overall, it's a huge cost reduction because it frees up a lot of time for data scientists to do what they're good at. It also minimizes and prevents a lot of bugs, and it's added this auditable trace. And probably you say, OK, um, sounds good to be true, but when should we use it? Uh, if I'm just starting, is ever time in, my, in the life of the company, it's like the first experiment should be ever done, should I immediately apply this concept? In this case, it was just first steps and nobody know whether in the future we'll do something in this direction, probably is not the good place to start. If you just want to experiment with one specific model or you want to uh, just to try one of the scientific papers, probably it's not the case to do. But if there is something that already you as a data scientist or your colleagues, a team started to work on, and right now there is a conversation that we'll finalize this business POC, we we'll finalize the technical POC, and if it works, then the next iteration will be moving in the direction of the MVP, where our models will be a part of, or a set of models. Um, there are different scenarios. So indeed, when it's time to go from proof of concept to MVP, that's a good place to start implementing machine learning pipeline. And on top of it, when it's time to scale. So if you have only one model um, and if there is no conversation about any other models in the future, probably we can lift up and keep up with some manual work. 
that if it's about we need one model, we need more, more, we need two models. Oh, by the way, another department wants the model as well. And then that's where it's time to stop and spend some time on creating the pipeline. And also, what's the biggest difference between, let's say, having automated pipeline and having a manual pipeline in place is in case if you're just starting, your product will be the model. Everything will be around model. You prepare some data, you engineer some features, you train a specific model, you evaluate the model, you check uh, the model, how explainable it is, are there any biases with the data? So you do all these checks, and then at the end, you have probably a model artifact that you want to deploy somehow. There are millions of ways how you can do it. But then the question is, what to do when you put this in production, how are you going to make sure that the feature engineering happens the same way? How are you going to make sure that all the features that you need are present to run predictions in it? So all these questions couldn't be just solved if you have only one separate artifact as a model. And when you create an automated machine learning pipeline, this is the case when you have literally the whole pipeline and then you can easily move this pipeline from one environment to another and further. So overall, when is a good way to start with machine learning pipelines? If you're just making the first ever steps and just experimenting, probably wait until you have some processes in place. And if there are some conversation about we have one model, we want more, that's definitely time to start. And of, of course, when the different departments want to do it as well. By the way, especially one of the biggest mistakes that I see in a lot of enterprises, they have separate departments do separate things and they have different levels of maturity, but there is no one overall strategy how to orchestrate and organize the whole data science project management. It's also something to think about. But OK, enough words about this. Let's take a look on the building blocks of the machine learning pipeline. Uh, probably when I'm talking about the pipeline, you're thinking like uh, probably one block is to um, extract data, another block is to prepare pre-process data, next block is to engineer features, next block is to train a model, next block is hyperparameter tuning, next block is an evaluation, next block is validation. Actually not. I spent a lot of time focusing too much on only inference pipeline that starting with, I pick up this model from a registry or from um, S3 buckets, Azure Blob Storage, whatever it's uh, saved. And then I'm gonna find a way how to deploy it properly. Then I will define how to do pre-processing and post-processing of the results of the model. And that's where it spends a lot of time. But when it's come to model monitoring and when the model should be retrained, how the model should be retrained. If you don't have specific building blocks in place, you will spend a lot of time writing glue code and different bash scripts or PowerShell scripts that will try to keep all this glue code together. And it's really, really prone to errors. So the first steps in the building block, that's exactly the moment when you're going to orchestrate the development of the models or experimentation. And I'm explicitly saying orchestrate. If you don't have specific steps running each after other, and if all the steps couldn't be uh, reproduced or replicated in a specific components of code, then it will be manual process, error prone. So in this case, what I'm asking for, I'm asking to think about how you can organize the model development process to make sure that it doesn't matter in which environment you will put it, it will run in the same way. So in these steps, you're trying with playing around exactly with different, uh, probably machine learning algorithms, or doing some uh, extra feature engineering or uh, doing some uh, hyper tuning as well. And in this case, what expected to have uh, not a bunch of Jupyter notebooks scattered all over local laptops. In this case, it should be a repository with a source code. And the source code could represent different steps of this pipeline. Also, different steps could be different languages. Usually, when you work with big data, you'll start with a data ops part that's executed, for example, in, in Spark, and it could be PySpark, it could be Scala. So there are different versions of it, Java. And then the next steps, for example, for the model training, if it's not about big data, but with working with small data, it could be done uh, pretty easily with available Python libraries. So once again, 
think about it as not like one GitHub repository, but think about it at a place with a source code for each pipeline component. And why do you need to have this? Because the next step will be continuous integration. And what's happened here is we want to make sure that we can go take your source code. Remember, it's reusable, separate, uh, separated components uh, for each step, and we can actually uh, build the source code and run the test. And when I'm talking about the test, it's not only about unit test, integration test, it's also about a specific test that's required for machine learning models. It will be data validation test, it will be data inputs output test, it will be the model test to make sure that the model returns the same results, and also to make sure that it's within specific limits that you expect to get from it. So that's exactly where, um, as soon as the source code is there, for example, with um, merge with a master, a different set of repos, uh, or if you're using monorepo style, it could be different. There are specific triggers that start this continuous integration process and build source code, uh, run the test, the specific test, and then as an output, you get a package. And it could be also not one package, don't think about one component, but a set of packages also could be done in different languages. And the set of these languages could be easily uh, transformed further uh, by the next step. The next step is the continuous delivery of this pipeline. So although you have your code ready, you package your code properly, it could be a set of different artifacts. And then it's time to test it, to battle test it in different environments. Because usually I see a lot of issues while setting up the proper environments for machine learning processes. Usually I see some kind of sandbox and then immediately production, nothing in between. And when you start uh, questioning okay, I understand, but where are the testing staging environments? Oh, we don't get, it, it's really hard to get data there. So if you have the pipeline that is capable of extracting data from specific sources, uh, that's exactly, it's really good first step to orchestrate and set up other environments where before going to production settings and without, uh, let's say, firefighting things in production that could be easily prevented with some specific tests or orchestration steps, you do it in a proper environment. So we had our pipeline that starts with from data extraction and delivers as specific components of machine learning model, then we package it and then we deploy it to specific target environment to check how it's doing there also to try it with new subsets of data, for example, that the model has never seen before. And the next step we, where we go, and that's exactly when you have your automated pipeline and you're just waiting for the trigger in a production environment. And here, as soon as the new data come in, you can trigger your pipeline and it starts, um, it do the whole run. And at the end, you will get the pipeline with a trained and preferably registered machine learning model. So for this, there are also different tools to use. Um, we get back to these tools at the end of uh, my talk. So in this case, once again, don't think that you have only a model as a separate artifact, but you have the whole pipeline. And in case something went wrong, you can always re-trigger it once again to get this model. Also, the beauty of this approach is in the sense that you have the whole pipeline traceable and you know exactly that everything that you've done in dev environments and the results that your model delivered in the dev environment will be almost the same results here. And if you see a huge difference, it's a sign that something goes wrong in the specific, specific steps. So the next step is as soon as your model runs in production and it's delivered the, uh, let's say, the most awaited model, that's where another step's coming in, and it's usually triggered as soon as, for example, the model is added to register or the model is moved in the model registry from one stage to another stage. That's where you start the so-called model continuous delivery process. And in this case, it could be different pipelines running. It could be pipeline that pick up your, um, your model uh, split in the specific components and uh, expose your model via RESTful API. It could be a pipeline that grab your code and deploy it as a part, for example, of the Kafka streaming application. It could be the pipeline that pack your code and deploy it on edge device and do some transformations. There are different of, of the options. So don't think about this step as only 
uh, I'm just gonna expose my model with RESTful API. There could be different approaches in it. And the last step, the really, really underestimated step is the monitoring. I will talk about it later. What's important to say here, so based on some specific subsets of monitoring, you can set up a triggering or to retrain the model, or if you see that the changes are so great that your, your, your machine learning pipeline will not be capable of handling it even with retraining of the model, that's where you can exactly trigger the uh, development and experimentation process where you can get new data, where you can discuss new features, and where you can discuss and really uh, fast test different approaches. So in a nutshell, uh, the, let's say the old way of thinking about machine learning pipeline was that we have something, we have already a model, we just pick this model and we talk only about inference pipeline, where we're working with this model, we deploy it in a specific way, and then we monitor, and then we decide ad hoc what to do if something goes wrong. And the, the most right approach, and it will also um, save you a lot of time later if you have specific standard process in place that going from the moment of raw data to the moment of generating insights and predictions. And this process could be packaged, could be described in specific steps, could be properly orchestrated with all, for example, experiment logging in, uh, experimentation of all runs uh, with logs in. And then you go to the end where you have this service in production. It could be, once again, a combination of different models. It could be a models deployed in one or another way. And you have specific monitoring specific of this use case that is capable of triggering or model retraining or capable of getting back to the start and doing the whole process again. So regarding engineering, of course, it's a lot of words, but usually what we are more interested in it, uh, we want to make sure that we know not we ready let's say for any fail that's gonna come and also we know that it's not possible literally to pick up everything that we have and um during this time to solve uh during for example development state to pick up all edge cases there definitely will be some specific use cases you're not aware about or not expected to get but anyway what we can do to make sure that our machine learning pipeline is properly engineered so in this case, I always say it's pipeline, it has input and it has output. Always check, do input checks. And by input checks, what do I mean here is not just a testing, uh, what are the data, data validation, but make sure that if the data that are there is not in the proper format, you don't start your pipeline at all. And if you don't start your pipeline at all, the next question is, is the output checks. So, if something went wrong and the model delivers some really strange prediction, what should you do? Based on how your model is consumed or is it like end users, uh, your customers, or is just uh, the, pipe, the machine learning pipelines that deliver something in batches and then just person reads uh, data from models prediction from SQL or from other object storage, what to do if model produced really weird results? So that's the third point is there should always be a fallback there. So in case that if there is no proper input data coming in or the data looks really weird and have really a lot of strange values, that's where we stop the pipeline and we get in back a user specific message or we're not capable of uh, doing predictions because of this or update data. There could be different options. Output checks is how sane the results of your model are. If you know that you're doing, for example, binary classification and you're expecting zero and one, it will be really strange if your model delivers something like three, right? And in this case, also the model feed fallback. If you're seeing that something really weird happening with your model, what do you want to get back to your users? And then the next thing is engineering for performance. So in this case, we always want to make sure that our model predictions are scalable. And if, for example, we are exposing our model with RESTful APIs, that we know that our model was tested properly before that. Otherwise, we will not be capable to scale it in the way as we want. Uh, another thing is usage of caching. I also noted that a lot of people completely forgetting about it. And actually, it's really useful <laughs> tool. So you can cache inference results, for example, if you see that there are some specific requests that are exactly the same as um, the, or, or there are some often types of requests 
you can just pre-cache some inference results. There are some specific models that require caching. Otherwise, it's really expensive to calculate, uh, calculate the results each time. So there are also something to think about it. And also, uh, based on how our model is deployed, how we're going to implement the feedback collection about how our model performing, for example, from the perspective of the user. So that's really important things to think about. And then, let's say, the debugging and monitoring part, uh, probably you can spend a lot of time on it. Uh, it's worth a, a little, some, let's say, a lot of weeks of just uh, <laughs> learn something about it. What I want to share here, um, there are different things that uh, different from traditional software engineering with ML, because on top of specific code versioning, code tests, and code, and let's say this simple system monitoring, we get on top of it data test, model test, and data monitoring and prediction monitoring. And as I promised, I would like to share the top three debugging issues that I see in almost every day uh, in my work with different clients. And guess what? This is the biggest issue, especially with Python libraries. So we have a model trained in specific environments where we have unpinned libraries. And then, for example, when Pandas or Scikit-learn uh, made an upgrade and deprecate some methods, uh, that's guess what happened? The whole data preprocessing part falling apart. Uh, if you have, for example, some specific Pandas transformation or you do it one hot encoding uh, with Scikit-learn or something different, uh, and it doesn't work at all, um, that's we're getting back to the time welcome glue code and welcome unpinned libraries. And another thing that also um, creates some issues, it literally scattered config for different environments. So that's another story. And uh, the hardest part in it is that uh, we have uh, some specific config, model-related config hard-coded in the code. Another part is hard-coded in some JSON files. Then we have uh, some, uh, par some parts partially, let's say, um, deployed with uh, configuration settings that read in from here. That's a set of configuration settings sitting in another JSON that is from, um, let's say it's written from the bash script in a specific mode of deployment. People, I'm just begging you, uh, let's put some, <laughs> let's put some order in this chaos because every time with every quick fix with the bash or with every quick fix uh, with um, like, I'm just write config here or write config there, that's the say, that's, that's the problem. So uh, the thing is here that um, that's exactly the most three top debugging issues that I have. So yeah, um, if you can just start pinning libraries, trust me, it saves so much time for all engineers that will be uh, going to work on this. Um, you will guess how much time uh, it could be free up. And regarding monitoring, see that our time is going up, but it, what I wanted just to mention about monitoring, usually remember that you have uh, three types of monitoring for uh, the models, where the system you just monitor a specific technical metric, such as CPU, RAM, uh, um, if you're working with APIs, amount of requests, uh, if you're working with serverless, uh, there are different types of things to monitor. And there should be some data monitoring as well that's checking the input data and the checking data distributions, changes in the data, the model monitoring, the checking what's the model output, how it looks like, what's the difference between them, between the different, uh, let's say, uh, the different environments, and also uh, the difference between mapping on uh, the incoming data and the output that you get. But without further ado, um, as I mentioned, there is just a set of Python libraries that you're using. I skip uh, really, let's say, the, the the libraries that probably use every day, such as uh, Panda Secret Learn, I just went a little bit high over. That's exactly the tools that I was working with. And one tools, uh, one of my favorite ones is the Great Expectations for the Data Validation, uh, the Feast of the Feature Store, and uh, Alibi, Alibi Detect and Alibi Explain, because it helps a lot with model interpretability and debugging and monitoring, and has a lot of algorithms already implemented by you, so you don't need to implement everything from scratch. Uh, and also one of the favorites is MLflow um, because there are different components that you can reuse and it aids uh, traceability and reproducibility uh, to your um, machine learning pipeline journey. So yeah, I think uh, I already ate probably all time for the questions. So <laughs> Martin, <laughs> do we have any questions? <laughs> Yes, 
Thank you very much for this talk. I really enjoyed it and I really like your pipeline. I will adapt it for sure. Um, there are some questions being typed and let's start with, we have a little bit of time for questions. Questions are important. One question is, do you still use Ooh. Jupyter Notebooks for prototyping or not at all? <laughs> Okay, yes, it's possible. Uh, only one thing that I want to ask you, uh, like Databricks notebooks, Zeppelin, Jupyter notebooks, it's awesome tools, great, you can add extra things to it. But please keep them indeed for prototyping, for ADA. Um, there are lots of issues with them in production. There are tools to fix it, but trust me, these tools just add in the layers of complexity. So yes, I do. <laughs> I use them, although I'm not a great fan of it. But if I need quick prototyping, I usually do it. Next one. Next one. Do you have experience using DVC for setting up machine learning pipelines? What's your opinion on it? Opinion from like, if you have nothing, it's a great tool to use. Although it depends on the environment you're working on. Uh, is it on-prem? Is it hybrid, for example, with a cloud? Is it multi-cloud? Because, for example, in the cloud, you have a replacement for it, so it can uh, run differently. Usually, if it's not about big data and uh, there is a pretty simple on-prem setup, that's where I use DVC. Or, as well, for example, a starting point uh, while transition to the cloud. And let's say my opinion, I use not the whole package. I usually only use it for uh, literally data set registration, uh, but I'm not use it as specifically for all I, for all pipeline step because in my case I'm more probably um, I prefer the old ways where you define specific things uh, at the YAM files and just give uh, to any orchestrator uh, card blanche to use it. So yeah, yeah. yes and no <laughs> at the same time. Unfortunately, we are running out of time and there are okay. more questions. So I hope you will come to the chat and answer them while we are moving yes, to the if, next talk. Yes, thanks. If not, you can always look up for my name is Hermé, you can find me on the internet and I will happy to answer your questions because I still need to work further <laughs> today. Thanks a lot. Okay, okay. Thank you very much again for this talk and see you around.